begin by simply listening. Slow down and see just how peaceful today can be. Alright, this is Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time with Orson Welles' Julius Caesar. And here we go. beginning is a very delicate time. Know then that it is the year 10,191. The known universe is ruled by the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, my father. In this time, the most precious substance in the universe is the spice melange. The spice extends life. The spice expands consciousness. The spice is vital to space travel. The Spacing Guild and its navigators, who the spice has mutated over 4,000 years, use the orange spice gas, which gives them the ability to fold space. That is, travel to any part of the universe without moving. Oh yes. I forgot to tell you, the spice exists on only one planet in the entire universe. A desolate, dry planet with vast deserts. Hidden away within the rocks of these deserts are a people known as the Fremen, who have long held a prophecy that a man would come, a messiah, who would lead them to true freedom. The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune. Broadcasting system takes pleasure tonight in bringing you the first of a new series of weekly broadcasts by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. Two months ago, this brilliant Broadway company came to radio as the first complete theatrical producing unit ever to take the air. Hailed by stage critics as the brightest moon to rise during recent years over New York's legitimate theater, the name of Orson Welles has become a byword to the greater Broadway of the country as a whole. After nine weeks, this is what the radio critics say. The radio dial declares everything was well nigh perfect. A feather in the cap of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Bill Byrd and the Pasadena, California Independent Unit. The program sparkled with originality, cleverness, and skilled acting. The series suggests new avenues of approach in the development of radio drama. Says the St. Louis Democrats, a master of the theater, be it stage or radio, 
Mr. Wells' choice of classics is a master strike. A must for any listener, declares the Camden, New Jersey Post. And finally, the Cleveland Plain Dealer asserts, there was nothing in the production the ear could not see. It's now a habit for Orson Welles to produce his radio show. And so tonight, by overwhelming popular demand, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air open a new cycle of broadcast dramas with a radio production of their greatest stage success to date, Shakespeare Caesar. And here is Orson Welles himself to tell you about it. The director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these programs, Orson Welles. Good evening. Julius Caesar was done by the Mercury Theater without benefit of toga. It was as timely last October as it was 1,650 years after Caesar's murder when Shakespeare wrote it. And it is as timely today. A glance at your newspaper headlines and you will understand why tonight we could wish for the extra dimension of television. Shakespeare's great political tragedy about the death of a dictator, which is also the personal tragedy of a great liberal exists in all times without identification or special reference to its time. Its story is real Roman history and its source is the Roman historian Plutarch. From the Plutarch text for the medium of radio broadcasts, we have arranged a running commentary on the action of the play. No voice is better known and none could be more suitable than that of radio's outstanding news commentator, Mr. H. V. Kaltenborn. And so tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System begins the new series of the Mercury Theater on the Air with Orson Welles' world-famous production of Julius Caesar. Starring the original New York cast, Orson Welles as Brutus, Martin Gable as Cassius, George Kouloris as Anthony, and Joseph Holland as Caesar. With music by the celebrated American composer Mark Blitzstein and H.B. Calvinborn as the narrator. This is the history of a political assassination, the killing of a man who tried to make himself king. It is an account of how the murder was prepared, how it was carried out, and what happened later to the men who took part in it. When the Civil War was ended, Caesar was 55. By Pompey's death, he had made himself the most powerful man in the empire. His countrymen, in the hope that the government of a single person would give them time to breathe after so many civil wars and calamities, now made him dictator for life. Honors were conferred upon him which seemed to exceed the limits of ordinary human ambition. This gave offense to those who looked with an evil eye on his position and felt oppressed by his power. A conspiracy was formed against him headed by Cassius, one of Pompey's generals, whom Caesar had pardoned after the Civil War. But what gave the common people their first quarrel with him was their growing suspicion that he aspired to be king. The 15th of February was a national holiday, and there was a huge gathering of the people. As Caesar went through the streets, a strange voice was heard in the crowd warning him to prepare for some great danger on the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March! Did every noise be still? Oh, no. Caesar paused for a moment, and then, as the voice was still, marched on between the rows of soldiers who guarded him. <laughs> Calls on me. Mark Anderson. Caesar, my lord. 
and get a tongue shriller than all the music cries Caesar. Caesar! Ah, who calls? Speak! Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the eyes of man! What man is it? What sayest thou to me? Speak once again. As soothsayer bid you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Come from the throne. Look upon Caesar. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Forum, high above the heads of the people. So look at me, go ahead. A golden throne had look been set him. for Caesar. Mark Antony, his friend, was consul at the time. When he came into the forum and the people made way for him, he went up and reached to Caesar a crown wreathed with laurel. Upon this there was a shout, but only a small one, made by the few who were planted there for that purpose. And when Caesar refused the crown, there was universal applause. Later, Caesar's statues were found with royal diadems on their heads. Marullus and Flavius, two tribunes of the people, went presently and pulled them off. For this, Caesar had them arrested. This was the day on which Cassius, the leader of the conspiracy, first came to Brutus, the most honored man in Rome, and tried to enlist his aid. Louder. Can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. It is just quieter. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius? That you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me. Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. What means the shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king, don't I you, people? Fear. Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius, yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it you would impart to me? I cannot tell what you or other men may think of this life. But for my single self, I had as lief not be, as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have said as well, we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he, for once, up in a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores. Caesar said to me, um, Darest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Up in the world, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I think. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar, and this man has now become a god. And we, petty men, walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fate. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underling. <laughs> Are you 
few people. I'm not running this show. Captain. I have no such answer. Kepka, if you speak with me, I Kepka. Tell us what's chest. Why, there was a crown offered here. And being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand, thus. And then the people fell a shouting. Who offered him the crown? Why, Anthony. What is the manner of it? I can as well be hanged to tell the manner of it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. It was not a crown, neither. It was one of these coronets. And as I told you, he put it by once. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it to him again. Then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. He put it the third time by. And still as he refused it, the rabblement hooted and clapped their chopped hands. And often such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar refused the crown that it had almost choked Caesar. But he swooned it and fell down at it. And for mine own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. What said he when he came unto himself? He said if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. <laughs> Three or four wenches where I stood cried, Alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. Is this worth saying anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. To what effect? Those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for my own part, it was Greek to me. I could tell you more news, too. Morales and Flavius were pulling scarves off Caesar's images are put to silence. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. And so it is. For this time I will leave you. What you have said I will consider. What you have to say I will with patience hear. And find a time both me to hear and answer such high things. Till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions as this time is like to lay upon us. There were both. Well, Brutus, thou art noble. Yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Therefore, it is meet that noble minds keep ever with their likes. For who so firm that cannot be seduced? If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. I will this night in several hands. In at his windows throw, as if they came from several citizens' writings, all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name. Wherein obscurely... Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, let Caesar seat him sure, for we will shake him, or worse days endure. It is probable that Caesar was not unaware of the conspiracy, for when it was reported to him about that time that Dona Bella was in a plot against him, he said he did not fear such fat, luxurious men but rather the pale, lean fellows, meaning Cassius. Mark Antony, Peter. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men and such as sleep on nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. Such men as he are never at heart's ease whilst they behold a greater than themselves. And therefore are they very dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He is not dangerous. I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear. For always, I am Caesar. No production there. In the weeks before the murder, many strange prodigies and apparitions were observed. As to the lights in the heavens, the noises heard in the night, and the wild birds which perched on the housetops, these are not perhaps worth taking notice of in so great a case as this. But a number of men 
were seen in the forum looking as though they were heated through with fire, fighting with each other. A quantity of flame issued from the hand of a soldier's servant so that they who saw it thought he must be burned, but he had not been hurt. There were fearful storms over the city. The conspiracy continued to spread. Who's there? A Roman. Catch us by your voice. Your ears. Brought you Caesar home? What night is this? A very pleasing night to honest men. How about you move when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing in turn? Oh, Cassius, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds have arrived in Adios. And I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exhausted with the threatening clouds. But never till tonight, never till now, did I go through a tempest dropping fire. I saw you anything more wonderful. Oh, they were drawn upon a heap a hundred ghastly women, transformed with their fear, who swore they saw men all in fire walk up and down the streets. And yesterday, the third of night, even at noonday upon the marketplace, hooting and shrieking. When these prodigies do so conjointly meet, let not men say, these are their reasons, they are natural. Indeed, it is a strange, disposed time. Whoever knew the heavens menace so. Those that have known the earth so full of faults. Now could I send a name to the man most like this dreadful night. A man no mightier than myself. Or me. Caesar that you mean. Is it not Cassius? Indeed they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king. And he shall wear his crown by sea and land in every place. Save here in Italy. I know what I will wear this dagger then. Hold my hand. And I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. Come to us. You and I will yet ere day see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him as ours already. And the man in fire from the next encounter yields him out. Still Brutus hesitated, and still the conspirators tried to win him to their cause. Letters were placed where he would find them. You are asleep, Brutus. You are no longer Brutus. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake and see thyself. Shall roam. Speak, strike, redress. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake. Such instigations have been often dropped where I've took them up. Shall Rome... Hmm, thus must I piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's fall? What? Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin Drive when he was called a king. It must be by his death. I know no personal cause to spurn at him. But for the general, he would be crowned. Now that might change his nature. There's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder and that craves wary walking. Around him. That. And then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the upmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So uh, Caesar Jess, may. Could you swap lights? Then, lest he may. Love you. Prevent. In the end, Brutus agreed to meet the conspirators in the garden of his house. The men who came that night were Cassius, Tasca, Sinop, Trebonius, 
and Decius Brutus. It was decided that Caesar should be killed in the Senate on the 15th of March, the day on which the crown would again be offered to him. Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Caesar's word. I think it is not me, Mark Antony. So well beloved of Caesar should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver. And you know his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Which to prevent? Let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us see sacrifices, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar. And in the spirit of men there is no blood. For that we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But alas, Caesar must plead for it. Quiet in the studio. And gentle friends, let's carve it. The dish fit for the gods. Not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds. Count the clock. The morning comes upon us. You leave you, Brutus. Give me our hands all over one by one. Let us swear our resolution. Jesus. No, not an oath. It's not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse. If these be motives weak, break off the times and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. As these, as I'm sure they do, they are fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women. Then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not falter? And what other oath than honesty to honesty engaged that this shall be? For we will fall for it. On the 14th of March, the day before the assassination, Caesar supped with Marcus Lepidus, and as he was signing some letters, and according to his custom, as he sat at table, there arose a question of what sort of death was the best, at which he immediately, before anyone could speak, said, a sudden one. After this, as he was in bed with his wife, all the doors and windows of the house flew open together. He was startled at the noise and the light which broke into the room and sat up in his bed, where, by moonlight, he perceived his wife fast asleep, but heard her utter in her dream some indistinct words and inarticulate groans. She fancied at that time she was weeping over Caesar and holding him butchered in her arms. When it was day, she begged Caesar not to leave the house, but to adjourn the Senate to another time. Caesar laughed at her fears, and when the time was come, he started for the capital. On his way, he was handed a paper in which the whole plot was disclosed with the names of the conspirators. After his death, it was found still unopened. When Caesar entered, the Senate stood up to show their respect for him. Of the conspirators, some came about his chair and stood behind it, and others stood in front of him and talked to him. Then Tilius, laying hold of Caesar's cloak with both hands, pulled it down from his neck, which was the signal for the assault. Casca, that stood behind him, gave him the first wound in the neck. It was not mortal, and Caesar turned and put his hand on the dagger and kept hold of it. The conspirators closed around him with their naked knives in their hands. Which way soever he turned, he was met with blows and saw their blades leveled at his face and eyes. For it had been agreed that they should each of them make a thrust at him and flesh themselves with his blood. For which reason, Brutus also gave him one stab in the groin. Some say that he fought and resisted all the rest. Pleasure. 
live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. That here by Caesar and by you cut off the choice and master spirits of this age. Oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. What compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in the number of our friends? Friends, am I? With you all. And love you all. Upon this hope that you shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And then, moreover, suitor, that I may produce his body in the marketplace and in the pulpit as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Suitor, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. Know you how much the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon. I will myself into the pulpit first. Mark Antony. Here, take you Caesar's body. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar and say you do it by our permission. Else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. You shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going. After my speech is ended. Be it so. I do desire no more. Prepare the body, then. Follow us. The body is the man he loved best and admired most in the world. Almighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils, front to this little measure? That I did love thee, Caesar, oh, tis true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Antony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes? Most noble, in the presence of thy cause, had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendship with thine enemies. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be in use, and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war and see the spirits ranging for revenge. With Ate by his side, come hot from hell, share in these confines with a monarch's voice. I have a and this the dogs of war. Then Brutus came down from the capital among the crowd and made a speech to the people who listened without expressing either pleasure or resentment but showed by their silence that they pitied Caesar and respected Brutus. Be patient. Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen, lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. 
Not that I love Caesar less, but that I love Rome. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for you. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any speak for him, I offend it. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak for him, have I offended? Who is here so vile that would not love his country? If any speak for him, have I offended? I pause for a reply. None, 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 none. And none have I offended. I've done no more to Caesar than you will do to Brutus. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony. Though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying. A place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not. Good countrymen, let me depart alone. And for my sake, stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse. And grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. You are listening? You are listening to the CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in the first of a new series of Sunday Night Dramatic Productions. Performance of Caesar will continue in just a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in Caesar, presented with the original Mercury Theater cast and with Orson Welles and the role of Brutus. When Brutus was gone, the body of Caesar was brought out into the forum, all mangled with wounds. And Antony made a funeral oration to the people in praise of Caesar. And finding them moved by his speech, he unfolded the bloody garment of Caesar and showed them in how many places it was pierced and the number of his wounds. He also told them at this time of Caesar's will, in which it was found that he had left a considerable legacy of money to each one of the Roman citizens. For Brutus' sake... I am beholding to you. What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus' sake, he finds himself uh, beholding to us all. Hey, speak no harm of Brutus here. Caesar was a tyrant. I the all this way to live. He's a tyrant! Hey, gentle Romans. Friends, Romans, countrymen, and the Aurelius. I don't see what Anthony can say. I come to bury Caesar. Not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often tethered with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. And it was so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Am I to speak in Caesar's funeral? He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffer still. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. <laughs> Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet, Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and sure. He is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to say what I do know. You all did love him once. Not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment. Thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause till it come back to me. He thinks there is much reason in his saying. Now consider rightly the matter. Caesar has had great wrong. I hear that with the words of his place. Mark ye his word. He would not take the crown. He would not take the crown. Therefore, it certainly was not ambitious. If he found so strong of your life. Poor I was weak. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who, you all know, are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But here's a parchment. With the seal of Caesar, I found it in his closet. It is his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. <laughs> I must not read it. It is not meat. You know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood. You are not stones, but men. And living men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. And this good, you know not that you are his heirs. Or if you should, or what would come of it? Yet you have a will. A will. A will. A will. myself to tell you of it. Here I wrong the honorable man oh, whose man. daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do Tell me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend? And will you give me leave? Come down. Yes. You shall have leave. No, Most noble and silent. A ring. Stand down. Stand from the earth. Stand back. Stand back. Stand back. Stand back. If you have tears. Prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nervii. Look. In this place ran Cassius dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this... The well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it as, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O ye gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude more strong than traitor's free. arms quite vanquished him then him. burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling of his face even at the base of Pompey's statue which all the while ran blood great Caesar fell oh what a fall was there my countrymen then I and you and all of us fell down while bloody treason flourished over us 
Now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. When you play my ocarina, I hope you will think of Weep you, when you but behold our seas as best you're wounded. Look you here. Here is himself. Fire, as you see, with traitors. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not that made them do it, but they are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reason answer you. I come not friends to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain blunt man that love my friends and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit nor words nor worth, action nor utterance or the powers of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. Tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there where an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Will mutiny burn the house of My friend, you go to do you know not what. Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your love, unless you know not? I must tell you then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Caesar's will? Yes, the will. And under Caesar's seal, he gives to every Roman citizen, to every several man, 75 dragmen! <laughs> Nothing to be seen but confusion. Some cried out to kill the murderers. Others tore away the benches and tables out of the shops round about, and heaping them all together, built a great funeral pyre. On this they set the corpse of Caesar and set fire to it. Then they took brands from the pile. Some of them ran to the houses of the conspirators. Others ran up and down the streets to find out the men who had killed Caesar and tear them to pieces. That night, Brutus, having said farewell to Portia, his wife, left the city with Cassius and their friends. Soon after, there arrived in Rome young Octavius, Caesar's adopted son, who was immediately elected consul. As his first act, he ordered a judicial process to be issued against Brutus and Cassius for having murdered a principal man of the state, holding the highest magistracies of Rome without being heard or condemned. No one appearing for the accusation, the judges were forced to pass sentence and condemn them both. It is reported that when the crier of the tribunal, as the custom was, with a loud voice cried Brutus to appear, the people groaned audibly, and many of the nobler citizens hung down their heads for grief. Hey, your After this, are Antony and Octavius made up a list for proscription in which were set those of their enemies oh, boy, that were designed the for the slaughter amounting is... to over 200 now. persons. 
in the my month dad owns that Ranch. the empire was divided into two factions. Dad went to the castle some to going some over to Brutus and Cassius, to others to Antony and Octavius. Two years after Caesar's murder, the armies of the two factions came face to face on the plains of Philippi. That night, Brutus sent for Cassius to come to his tent. There had been dissension between them lately. There was talk of corruption in Cassius' army, and Cassius himself was not above suspicion. Brother, you've done me wrong. Wrong I, mine enemies, but if not so, how should I wrong a brother? That you wrong me to appear in this. You have condemned a noted Lucius Teller for taking bribes here of the sergeants. We're in my letters, praying on his side, because I knew the man was slighted up. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offense should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm to sell and mark your officers for gold to undeserve it. I, an itching palm. You know that you're Brutus that speaks this, or by the God, this speech, what else you're last? The name of Cassius honors this corruption and chastisement to therefore hide its head. Chastisement! Remember, march! The eyes of march, remember. Did not great Julius plead for justice' sake? What villain touched his body that did stab? And not for justice. What? Shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but the supporting robbers. Shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honors for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I'd rather be a dog and bathe the moon than such a Roman. Bait not me, I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier, I... Older in practice, abler than yourself to make conditions. Go to, you are not cash. I am. I say you are not. Let me no more. I shall forget myself. Tempt me no farther. No way, so like man. This possible must I endure all this? All this? I more. Are you going Wretched to the castle, your fairy boy? Not break. Would you mind finding my dad? Must I observe? He must have fallen asleep somewhere around must the I castle. Must I stand and watch What a thing for an adult to do. Humor. <laughs> Oh yeah, if God, you, you look for him, of your I'll give this spleen, to you. Split you. I've been incubating this egg Ooh, very carefully. Thought I'll use you for my mirth, yea, for my laughter when you are waspish. You say you are a better soldier. Let's appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For my own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me in every way. You wrong me, Bruce. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? You did, I cannot. When Caesar lived, he does not thus have moved me. Peace, peace. You does not so tentative. I does not. No. What does not tempt him? For your life, you does not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that. I shall be sorry for. You have done that. You should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats. For I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass me by as the idle wind. I respect not. I did send you for certain sums of gold which you denied me. For I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I'd rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send you for gold to pay my allegiance which you denied me. Was that done by cash? I denied you nothing. You did. I did not. He was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus hath rived my heart. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities. But Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your fault. A friendly eye could never see such faults. The flatterers would not, though he do appear as huge as high Olympus. Come, Antony and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of the world. Hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, 
set in a notebook, learned and conned by rote to cast into my teeth. Ah, oh, I could weep my spirit from mine eyes. There's my dagger. I that denied thee gold will give my heart. Strike as thou didst deceive her! For I know when thou didst hate him worse. Thou lovest him better than ever thou lovest Cash. Sheathe your dagger. Be angry when you will. It shall have his gold. Do what you will. Dishonor shall be humor. That Cash is lived to be but mirth and laughter to his brutus. And grief and blood ill tempered vex of him. I was ill tempered too. Confess so much. Give my hand and my heart too. I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius. I'm sick of many griefs. Of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to Portia dead. Portia? She's dead. Mark Antony have made themselves so strong. With her death, that tidings came. With this, she fell distract. And died so. Even so. Deep of night has crept upon our talk. There's no more to say. No more. Good night. Early tomorrow, we'll be rising. Noble, noble Cassius. Good night. And good repose. Lucius. Here, my good lord. What thou speaks drowsily. Poor knave, I blame thee not. Thou art all watched. Look, Lucius, here's the book I sought for soon. I was sure your lordship did not give it me. Stay with me, good boy. I'm much forgetful. Thou hold up thy heavy eyes a while and touch thy instrument a strain or two? I am, lord, and please you. It does, my boy. Trouble thee too much, thou willing. It is my duty, sir. I not urge thy duty past thy might. I know young bloods look for a time of rest. I have slept already. Well done. Sleep again. I hold thee long. If I do live, it will be good to thee. Orpheus with his lute Made trees and the mountain tops that freeze Thou then selves when he did sing Da dum dee dee dum To his music plants and flowers Ever sprang as sun and showers There had made a lasting spring Da dum dee dee dum Everything that heard him play even the billows of the sea hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, healing care and grief of heart. All asleep. Or hearing die, di dum, dum di di dum. Yes.
the advice of Cassius, Brutus resolved to meet the enemy on the plain of Philippi. Never had two such large Roman armies come together to engage each other. That of Brutus was somewhat less in number than that of Antony, but in the splendor of the men's arms and the richness of their equipage, wonderfully exceeded. For most of their arms were of gold and silver, which Brutus had lavishly bestowed upon them. There is a story that immediately it? before the battle, two eagles falling upon each other fought in the space between the two armies, that the whole field kept in credible silence and all were intent upon the spectacle until at last that which was on Brutus' side yielded and fled. As soon as it was morning, the signal of battle, the scarlet coat, was sent out in Brutus and Cassius' camp. And the two friends met for the last time in the middle space between their two armies. I'm sorry. I got carried away with my story and I didn't even properly introduce myself. I am Zelda, Princess. Our most noble Brutus. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time that we shall speak together? We are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome. No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun. Whether we shall meet again... Yeah, that's how you tie it. I know not. I used to tie my hair like this every morning. Therefore our everlasting farewell take. Come home! Away! <laughs> battle was with Brutus. The right wing which he commanded drove back their opponents with great slaughter. Then they fell upon that part of Octavius' army which was exposed and separated and pursued them toward the sea. During this time, however, Cassius, with the main body of the army, was retreating before the attack of Antony. Expecting Brutus to come to his aid and acting by delay and expectation, rather than boldly and with a clear purpose, soon Cassius saw his whole army begin to give way. He did as much as ever he could to hinder their flight and bring them back, and snatching a flag out of the That's hand right, of the one that fled, he stuck it at his feet and begged the them to stand with him and fight. But the entrance is when he found wall, that he could not even time. keep his own personal guard together, Cassius retired to an empty to tent, door, taking along with him only Pindarus, one of his freemen, and pulling and his cloak over his head, he made his neck bare and held it forth to Pindarus, commanding him to strike. Cassius' head was found severed from his body, and beside it was found the same knife with which he had stabbed Caesar in the Senate house. gave the word too early, who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil, whilst we by Antony are all enclosed. This day I breathe it first. Time has come round. And where I did begin, that's shall I end. My life has run its compass. Come hither, Sira. And with his good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels. Search this bosom. Stand not to answer. Here. Take other helps. And when my face is covered. As it is now. Guide thou the sword. Caesar. Thou art revenged even with a sword that killed thee. 
some time later, Brutus, returning from the pursuit, wondered that he could not see Cassius' tent afar off, standing high as it was wont, and appearing above the rest of the camp. Then, for the first time, he suspected the defeat of Cassius and made haste to him. He heard nothing of his death until he came to the camp. Where? Where must Solid his body lie? Lo, yonder he is slain. The last of all the Romans. Fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Oh, Julius Caesar. Thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Satilia showed the torchlight. But the Lord, he came up back. He's Octane or slain. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. And hither, good Volumnius. Mr. Wood. What says, my lord? Why, this, Volumnius. The ghost of Caesar had appeared to me two several times by night. At Sardis once. And this last night here in Philippi Fields. I know my hour has come. Oh, not so, my lord. Nay, I'm sure it is, one of my Thou knowest that we two went to school together. To Don't be afraid to Even for that, our love of old, I pray thee, hold thou my sword hilts, whilst I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly. Fly, my lord. There's no tarrying here. Farewell to you, and you, and you, Volumnius. Straight, oh, thou hast been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee, too, straight, oh. Countryman. My heart of joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day. More than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes, my bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence I will follow. Christ's sake, I pray thee straight, O hold thy lord, thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword. Turn away thy face. I do run on it. Wilt thou straight, o? Give me your hand, sir. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good straight, o. Caesar. Now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. Brutus' dead body was found by Antony, who commanded the richest purple mantle that he had to be thrown over it. Then, before the assembled armies, he spoke over the body of his enemy. So Brutus should be found. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He, only on a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Tonight, Orson Welles and the original Mercury Theatre cast have produced Caesar, the hit of last year's theatrical season on Broadway, as the first in a new series of weekly hours which the Columbia Broadcasting System will present during the coming months. In response to the tremendous enthusiasm evoked by these programs, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theatre and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles.
We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man, yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds, as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, Intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the